Tonight, we are going to bring a little light into your life. This is DXB Today. Good evening and welcome to DXB Today. Tonight, we are celebrating the International Day of Light and discussing all the latest tech trends. Indeed we are. The day is globally observed to raise awareness about the importance of light-based technologies and sciences to improve the quality of life. Mm -hmm. And speaking of improving quality of life, we will be joined by experts in the tech space who will give us insight into the good and sometimes bad side of AI powered tools, just like ChatGPT. Uh, but over to you two, what do you think? AI, ChatGPT, good, no? I don't think it's so much a, an argument of good or bad. Mm -hmm. I think it's inevitable mm -hmm. and it's the way that you embrace it. If you, if you fully embrace AI and all its potential then that could be uh, troublesome but then you look at the benefits that it's having on so many different industries and individuals. That's my penance worth anyway. Yeah absolutely. I get my coat now. <laughs> Who needs the experts? We've got Tom. <laughs> what about you Dua? I absolutely love it. I think artificial intelligence is meant to be artificial intelligence and as humans, it's on us to have morals and ethics and use it for good. But if we use it for bad, we use it for bad. Look, there's that great website, isn't there? Um, and I highly recommend that none of us go on that website, <laughs> okay. right? Because TV presenters don't come out well, all right? Oh, no. But the, the website is willarobotstealmyjob.com. Um, oh, dear. Because the rise in technology. And let's just say that we are... Yeah, we're dispensable. Yeah, let's just hope our boss didn't hear that. How about that? <laughs> um, look, I think it's been wonders for me in terms of travel. Ch just travel itinerary, planning what I'm going to do, where I'm going to go. It gives me a full breakdown, especially because I'm vegetarian as well. It tells me like all the nice cafes and restaurants to go to because I'm not much of a planner. So I feel like it's for me, guys. I'm, I'm more on the good side. Now you've got Definitely. a private planner on the go. Yeah, you've got a PA. Go. There you go. Look at that. <laughs> Right, uh, on with the show and our guest co-host today. Who is that? Well, a TEDx speaker, no less, and an opportunity creator who is focused on educating us, people, in fact, uh, on how to embrace that change. Let's find out now who our guest co-host is today. Hello there. My name is Ravi Raman. I'm the publisher of Fast Company Middle East. I'm super excited to be today's guest co-host. I'll join you soon. Yeah, Ravi's going to share his in-depth knowledge of the digital landscape. Uh, and we get to hear more from him very shortly, so stay tuned for that. We'll no doubt touch on whether AI and other types of emerging tech uh, will wipe out certain jobs. Don't talk about <laughs> that too much at the moment. But before that, let's take a look at the fun side of tech first. Uh, Dina uh, has been checking out a high-tech gaming experience right here in Dubai. Let's check it out. Okay guys, I've just arrived at Magic Planet and I'm here to check out the region's first and ultra hyper immersive and ultra interactive gaming experience and it's called Immersive Game Box. Is it worth the hype though? Well, I've got a play to say. Okay, Ms. Gunn, I'm checking out four rooms behind me. I know there's lots of different gaming experiences available, but what makes this immersive game box experience just so cool? Yeah, so immersive game box is bringing people together through a shared play. Here we'll be using the hats. So hat has a sensor on it. You'll be the controller of the game after wearing the glasses. So what makes Immersive Game Box, I don't know, unique to the other gaming experiences we've had in the past? So here we'll be having minimum two players and maximum six players. So it's a, like a competition having between two. It's a family challenging games. Uh, we have a 60 minute games called a Squid Game, Ticket to Mars and many more and we have even Angry Birds, which kids enjoy a lot. Okay, Ms. Khan, so I clearly came unprepared because I don't have any friends. However, I am on a mission now to make some new friends so that I can uh, enjoy this gaming experience. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. All right, mission accomplished. Guess what I've made? Yay! A lot of friends. <laughs> okay, guys, you wanna go? <laughs> Let's go.
Okay, that was so much more fun than I expected it to be. There are 12 different games to choose from, all very different themes and challenges. It's the sort of thing you can keep coming back to. And I love that it's also for adults to play. All right, Immersive Game Box, definitely a thumbs up for me. Now, with us in this studio is the publisher of Fast Company Magazine's Middle East Edition, Mr. Ravi Rahman. Welcome to the show, Ravi. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, we have so much to talk about today, and we will get into it. But first, I would like for you to tell us more about who you are and what it is exactly that you do. All right, so uh, I've been in the media and the publishing industry all my life, so pretty much a very boring career. <laughs> Started with a newspaper, uh, moved into the region to launch the Middle East edition of Bloomberg Business Week, and currently I'm the publisher of Fast Company Middle East edition. Yeah, and that's, that's what it, about it. Mm -hmm. What's your sort of take, what's your house take, Ravi, in terms of AI? Obviously, ChatGPT is gaining and garnering a lot of the headlines at the moment, but artificial intelligence in general, is this going to be a game changer for the media landscape? Is it already? It already is. So just, just let's take a couple of steps back. You know, if you look at the last decade, whatever activity that we've done has been influenced by AI in some form or the other. The mail that you sent, a banking transaction that you do, an insurance claim that you make is all powered by AI. But what's significantly different now is that earlier there was a layer of AI in the services that we were using, right? So for example, you knew that something was powering Google Maps. But now that layer has been removed and we are directly interacting with AI. Mm. So ChatGPT is a classic example of we knowing that we are directly interacting with the AI model. Mm. That significantly changes the complete AI revolution, mm. right? So I think this is, to be very honest, a very, very significant change in the way humans use AI mm. and are impacted by AI. So what do you think is on the horizon? What's next? Now that ChatGPT is here, artificial intelligence is, you know, interacting with humans on a face-to-face -face level, what's next for us? Uh, what's next is a trillion dollar question, honestly. <laughs> I think even the people who are developing these models don't know what's next. But what's really happening is these AI models are becoming much more intelligent. Mm -hmm. They're learning faster. And that opens up a lot of new opportunities for all of us. So again, ChatGPT is one classic example. They've got about 100 million users yeah. in about eight weeks, yeah. which took Instagram or uh, Netflix a couple of years. Mm. Mm -hmm. So that, but what also is happening is 100 million users using ChatGPT fuels new data into the platform. Absolutely. So the rate of learning for these platforms and the AI models really grows exponentially. Mm. And what's interesting about this whole conversation, there's been a lot of talk about job loss, which we spoke about earlier, that we're, we're in Don't for it. Shaking. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> when I sat down with uh, the serial entrepreneur, Gary Vee, he said that... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That. yeah. That. Just, <laughs> just drop that name moment. in there. Yeah, look at that. Um, you know, he said that people need to get with it, obviously. That is, we're past that part of it. But now people need to understand that AI is actually creating jobs for us as well. Yeah. Can you tell us more about that and, and not, <clears throat> not to be scared of it? All right, so first of all, we need to relook at the concept of jobs, yeah. right? So let's look at, for example, the banking industry. What is the purpose of a banking industry? Is it to provide jobs for bankers or give better service, financial service to consumers, right? So once we look at or relook at the whole job paradigm and see what is best for that particular industry, is having AI better for that industry or has having humans better for the industry? So for example, the way AI has revolutionized banking and fintech is really amazing. What was the last time you went to a bank, branch bank, mm. yeah. right? So there are certain careers that will definitely lose out, but the others will evolve. For example, the role of teachers would completely change because you have your children learning from AI, but they would, there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Mm. Uh, you've got some awards coming up this week. Is that tomorrow night? Is that uh, yes, it is. It's perfect timing, actually. <laughs> uh, so we are hosting the Most Creative People in Business list and awards gala night tomorrow. Uh, it's, it's a unique list for Fast Company. We've been doing that globally for the last 14 years. Yeah. It's different in a way that this is not a list about CEOs or the most powerful people or billionaires. It's about creativity and how people are using creativity to really transform their industries but also inspire millions. Okay. Mm. 
So, so who's on the list? Tell mm -hmm. us. <laughs> I'm keen to know. I, I would lose my job if I tell you the oh. list. <laughs> I would rather keep my job. But we did host this last year. Mm -hmm. And we had some really inspiring names. As, as I said, it's beyond business. So we have artists, we have athletes, we have business tycoons, we have policy makers and politicians. Wow. Give us some Before. sneak peeks. Who was on the list last year, if you can disclose that? So, uh, okay, the obvious names we had people like Uda Katan, mm -hmm. we had Isam Qasim. Uh, so the interesting part about the list is we had 35 names last year, Incredible. 24 were women, which we are really proud of. Mm -hmm. So And it was a very diverse list. The youngest was 21 years old, the oldest was 70. Mm -hmm. We had a billion dollar business maker like Uda Katan and we had a startup with just two employees. Mm -hmm. So the list is I think more, most inclusive and very diverse. Well, if ever you're looking for a very good awards host, I can highly recommend Nimi. She's, uh, she's brilliant. Um, oh, thanks, and so are you. Oh, Maybe no, I've retired. Don't oh, worry okay. about that. We're done with it. To, to, We're to done with it. She's doing it all. <laughs> we will hear more about that just after the break. We will learn about the latest tech AI tool that's taking the world by storm, ChatGPT. Find out more after this. Yeah, welcome back to DXB Today. And now we're joined in studio by a knowledge engineer who helps companies to incorporate AI into their work practices. A warm welcome to Fahad Bazari. Thanks so much indeed for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Now, let's go dive straight into the organisation, if we can, because you are the founder of the IIAILA. But that is the International Institute for AI Literacy and Adoption. Why did you set it up? Uh, I set it up because I understood what's going on now. As humanity, we're moving into a new era. And, uh, you know, it's, it's something that none of us have faced before. And AI is something to be learned. It's a literacy. It's a language. Talking to robots is not like talking to one another. And the AI, it's not software. It's not a website. You know, it, these are very large language models, models in general. And if we don't actually understand what it's all about, then instead of it being co-pilot for us, mm. we will be its passenger. Mm. Now, I was uh, doing an episode mm. on the show last week where we were talking about financial literacy, and mm -hmm. I'm 32 years old, and only now am I learning more about finance. And we discussed how it should have been implemented in school, in the curriculum, very early on. How are we looking at AI literacy? Are we looking at implementing that quite, quite at an early stage so that when someone is 32, they won't feel a bit out of it and lost? I, I think actually with children, it's the opposite. Mm. I think they're going to grow up naturally AI literate. I don't think we have to worry about their AI literacy. For them, what we have to worry about is their human literacy, mm. that they don't lose the kind of skills that we have, you know, the most important being critical thinking. You know, it's so easy for a young person to go, let the AI do it for me, let the AI do it for me. We say, yeah, but the AI actually got it wrong. Mm -hmm. And they don't actually know that. They're just choosing convenience over correctness, for example. So right. it's the opposite for kids. Mm. So tell me, uh, do you think we are ready in terms of AI ethics? Because that's, again, a very, very <laughs> serious concern. So AI literacy is fine, but are, is the market ready in terms of ethical AI? Uh, the short answer is no, and the reason for that is because we've all been thrown in the deep end. And the companies behind that, I have a personal suspicion that that was actually the plan all along, because if we introduced ethics early on in the conversation, everything would be delayed. And of course, there are commercial interests behind a lot of it now. And so their goal is get product out, get everybody addicted to the product, get everybody paying for the product, make everybody dependent upon the product. And so Microsoft fired its ethics teams, Twitter fired its ethics team. A lot of people, and I have a joke with, with the guys at my company, whenever some certain topics come up, we joke, listen, the ethics team has been fired, move on. And oh, I say that in, in, in lighthearted, but for, for all of us, ethics means different things. Now there's a conversation on an international global level as to what ethics means. And then there's conversations to be had within companies. And then there's conversations for your own self as to what ethics means. It, 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 obviously, there is a, a large debate ongoing at the moment with regards to the use of artificial intelligence. And I know, I go back to the point I meant with Revy, uh, after chat GPT getting a lot of the headlines at mm -hmm. the moment. But is it helpful when you get people like Elon Musk and other uh, tech CEOs coming together and go, oh, we just need to slow down a little bit? Isn't that sort of ringing a few warning signals? 
Uh, that's for me. That's not a warning signal no? because if you you've got a big tech CEO like Elon Musk saying slow it down, I think behind the scenes he'd be speeding it up. Right. But when you do actually, okay, I get it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's just like, yeah. listen, we need. If you slow down, the, I promise I'll do it as well. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And and but the reality is, is that at a, at a geopolitical situation, we can't slow down. Because people say, well, look, if we slow down as a nation, there are other nations that are speeding up. Yeah. And then there's the danger that they get ahead of us and so on. So there's a whole geopolitical element to it. However, it is important that all of us, we don't just rush into it. Because I've seen people, I remember my son, you know, on the topic of children, he came to me and he was like, Baba, I did this in ChatGPT and it's amazing. And it had a citation at the bottom. And I looked at it and I said, did you check this citation? And he goes, no, why do I need to? I said, go and check it. I could tell that this citation was not going to exist in real life. And he went and checked it, and it didn't exist. And there's ways on the internet that you can look at, did it used to exist and it no longer exists? But in actual fact, it never existed. And the reason why he got carried away with it is because he doesn't, didn't understand how it could produce that. He thinks that he's speaking to an intelligent bot that is giving him factual answers. Yeah. But it's not. It's a language model that is predicting what should come next, which can sometimes actually not be true. So, Fahad, speaking of rules of engagement when it comes to artificial intelligence and using it as a language, so I understand you run an accelerator program, which I'm excited to join next month. Mm -hmm. But what are your top tips for our um, viewers on, you know, how to kind of fall, not to fall into the pitfalls of ChatGPT, how to get ahead of it? What kind of life lessons could you teach us from your accelerator program? Sure. So one of the, so I have my a curriculum which goes by the acronym Faster: Fundamentals, Attitudes, Skills transformational applications, ethics, and resources. And under the attitude side, the most important attitudes are, if you think of two wings of a bird to take flight, we're looking at optimism, whilst simultaneously suspicion. So we should be optimistic that this tool can do magical wonders for us, but at the same time, we also have to be suspicious of the content that it's giving us back. So the most important thing really comes down to that optimism. You've got people there that, of course, all of us are anxious about the future and how this is going to affect job displacement and so on. And so we are looking at it with like a pessimistic eye. And the reality is whenever you look at anything in life, not just AI, but just look at anything with a pessimistic eye, you'll only see the worst and yeah. you'll only experience the worst. Mm. So the single most important thing for all of your viewers is that optimism. Now, Fahad, I really want to thank you for joining us today. You have truly educated us, and we can't wait to see you back on the show. Now, at the end of a long day, most of us need a break from our devices. I know I do. And this company provides wellness pods that help you unplug and promote good sleep. Now, Khalid stopped by to find out more. Let's check it out. Have you heard of Z-Pods? Well, right here, this is the latest phenomenon in the US, and this is the only place where you can try to cure your sleep. All my years in aviation, it has been almost very hard for me to cure my sleeping patterns, but right now, I'll be able to cure it. I'm here with Dr. Leila Harb al Mahiri, founder of Alive Group, where she's gonna tell us a little bit about the medical industry. Well, it's a pleasure having you here with us, and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm Leila Harb al Mahiri, and I'm actually the founder of Alive Group, where we address different aspects of innovation in different fields. Can you tell us a little bit more about the center that you have here? This center is a medical rehabilitation center, but using an, a holistic approach. So this is my attempt of creating a center where it is if the future of uh, the medical service, which I believe in should be in, in UAE or around the world. So I know we've had a quick chat about Z-Pods. Yes. They sound very interesting, but I would love to hear more about it from you. Yes. Z-Pod actually is a sleeping capsule and it was manufactured or designed in the beginning for autistic children. Why autistic children? Because they have a lot of issues of sleep. They have a lot of challenges to fall asleep because of their certain, uh, you know, disability. So this capsule is designed to control the sensory environment for them from hearing with, with the music, from the lights inside, from the vibration in the bed, etc. Can I have one personally for me, like to use myself at home? Or absolutely. can companies install them for their employees? Absolutely, absolutely. This is what we are trying to work with different companies. They install these pods, two, three, and they the employees can take power naps. 
and also for people with uh, you know with uh, shifts and uh, and different rostering like air traffic controller you came from aviation air traffic controllers are very 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 uh, hard to concentrate if if you have some kind of fatigue they are in a controlled environment and they have to concentrate on the screen with the pilots you know it's very important for them to be alert very important for them to concentrate how soon do you start seeing the effects after using the pods absolutely the first day or the first night that you sleep in the pod you will see that you have a good night's sleep immediately immediately your sleep pattern will change well thank you very much doctor uh, i can't welcome. wait to try the pod now you're welcome Well, this has helped me to fall asleep very quickly. So I'm going to say to you good night because I'm going back to sleep. Has he, has he been seen since or not? Is he still Probably in there? not. <laughs> <laughs> we should really check on Khalid. <laughs> the best sleep ever. <laughs> uh, we definitely need one of those here in studio. Just saying, just saying. Okay. Uh, what's the time? It's time for the daily roundup uh, of what's hot, what's buzzing, what's going on around town. And there's only one person to turn to. Finger very much on the pulse of this city. Nimi. Mm -hmm, absolutely. The daily roundup. Well, what's going on? What are we talking about today? The technology behind so-called deep fake videos. It is helping people bring images of family members who have passed back to life by animating still photographs. Now, more than 65 million images have been animated by the deep nostalgia technology in the first month since it was made. Available to users of the My Heritage app and that helps create family trees and the company said it is really making moves at the moment. Now, I've seen a lot of deep fakes. Uh, around, especially on social media, it is terrifying. And I say that because you can tell when something isn't real. You can tell because it's still a bit off. But what's even more terrifying now, talking about us losing our jobs, mm. they can now deep fake voices. So, Tom, just say bye bye. You might as well just walk out now. Is is this me? <laughs> is this is, even is you? Is this me? Would you recognise you... yourself? But I, I certainly wouldn't recognise myself. That's for sure. But who knows? Maybe this is Tom's voice. <laughs> Image. Who knows? But there's a lot of these going around, Ravi, and it's is it a cause for concern? Well, it is. I think uh, anything that's deep fake or anything that's not original would always be uh, seen from a point of view of being scared about it. But it is a fact. So let, let me give you another perspective to it, right? So there are millions of children who have no access to education. What if, you know, there are clones or avatars of teachers mm -hmm. who are able to teach them? So you don't have to have physical teachers in these schools or homes, but you can have them cloned or have deep fakes of these people. What if we have personalities who are deep faked and they come back and actually teach children about history? So there are positives and negatives about it, everything. It, mm -hmm. it depends on how we really execute them and what kind of platforms are they used for. I don't know. I'm not too certain about it, guys. I see the positives. I do see the positives. But I've heard and I've also read that it's actually easy to see when something is a deep fake now. You know, the, the details are wrong. The hair, the eyes. The, they said that a lot of deep fakes don't blink, by the way. So uh, just watch Tom for the rest I'm, of the episode. I haven't blinked all, all that time. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm blink free at the moment. It is diff it's a difficult one. It's a difficult one for the media world as well, because sure. especially with the onset of social media, and we've seen some quite high-profile um, fakes recently with the Pope who was shown in a sort of body-length white mm -hmm. puffer. Very fetching. <laughs> Obviously, it was fake. Yeah. Uh, Donald Trump being arrested by the FBI, etc. And it's... It's one of those ones where you, I think you initially see it and you go, nah, that's got to be fake. And yet, your mind allows you to go, but what if? True. So, again, the technology is improving steadily. Every day we see the technology getting better. That's why I think some amount of guardrails, some amount of you know, ethical practices, regulatory practices need to be put in place. To give you a perspective, if you look at the healthcare industry or the medicine industry, right, or pharma industry, the amount of regulations they have to go through before a new drug is introduced is phenomenal. Mm. And that's why we are all safe. That's how, how, when you're buying a medicine from a pharmacy or a doctor prescribes it, there is trust. With AI, unfortunately, we've had these AI products being rolled out 
without very strict guidelines mm. and you know fail safes mm. for example nobody knows what the code is for an ai model mm -hmm. you just yeah. know that the ai model is learning but even the people who created the ai models because the models learning so fast and it's progressing so fast even they cannot really make out what is the end result so that's where i think ethical ai explainable ai and ai biases are something that we need to be really worried about mm. but playing devil's advocate here who's Whose role is it to come up with those ethics? You know, I, I, I'm in the banking sector at the moment, so the central bank is very vigilant on what we can and cannot do with these technologies. Um, but where there isn't such a stringent industry behind it, whose role is it really? Who polices it? Uh, to be very honest, it has to be the people who have the power. Okay. So right now, I think governments have the power because we are just expecting the big tech companies to self-regulate. Yeah. To a certain extent, it's happening mm. because we see people like Google, OpenAI being very responsible with what they're doing. Yeah. But eventually what will happen is when we have other players who are not so ethical yeah. competing with these big players who tend to be ethical, there would be an AI arms race. Mm. So you would have the bad actors doing all the unethical things to get ahead. So I think it has to be a coalition between governments, the tech companies, users. Mm -hmm. So again, to give an example, 10 years back, we were not concerned about privacy, right? We used to give out our email IDs, fill up forms. But the last three, four years, we've taken our privacy to be really, really valuable. Mm -hmm. So we've had rules and regulations being put up. So we have GDPR, we have also the UAE putting up very, very strict data privacy rules. Absolutely. So similarly, I think, consumers would have to understand the challenges with AI and demand regulations, demand fail mm, Absolutely. And I hear right after the break, we're going to hear a little bit more about how that works from an education perspective as well, and an ed tech perspective. So we'll be back after this. Yeah, welcome back to the show. Hope you're enjoying our chat, GPT, AI-inspired show. Our next guest is a mastermind, the mastermind behind a revolutionary educational AI-powered app. Uh, we're going to find out much more about it. A warm welcome to the founder of School Hack. It is Mohammed Khalid. Mohammed, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having good me. Good to see us. Thanks for good, to see, thanks good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Um, okay, School Hack. Yes. Explain it. To a Luddite like me, yeah. <laughs> over 40 years old, technology is not running through my veins. Yeah. What's it all about? Um, it's an AI powered tool for students just to help them through their education. And that's like basically saying it in a nutshell. So, <laughs> so I've got kids uh, sitting their exams at the moment. They were very excited about ChatGPT when that came onto the horizon. So they're like, <laughs> be gone, homework. <laughs> yeah. It's sorted. Yeah. Um, Obviously, that's a very simplistic way of looking at it. Of course, um, yeah. What, what, what do you do with School Hack, and what's the sort of what have you set out to achieve? Yeah, so we've actually put a bunch of tools together yeah. within our application, not to like uh, help students cheat or to make um, them do their homework like for, for free, basically without using their own critical thinking and general knowledge. We've actually just uh, empowered them with tools, with extra research tools. We've like it's kind of like. Um, you know, giving them a supercharge, like making them more productive with the help of AI. So that's what we've kind of done with our application. Right. Yeah. Well, so this is interesting, Mohammed, because this is what we were speaking about off air as well. I mean, this would have been amazing for me <laughs> during my school time. <laughs> yes. I feel like it would have helped me wonders. Uh, mm -hmm. But right now, you've one app, almost a million users <coughs> already on this app. Mm -hmm. What is the feedback that you've got so far? I imagine it's been mixed as well. Well, yeah, um, the feedback from the students have been great. Like every every day, I wake up to 100 plus emails from students saying how much that like, school hacks cha changed their life and made their life. Uh, a lot easier etc and yeah of course the feedback in at the start was uh, that it was a mixed feedback as you just said because uh, you know like especially like when you're looking at it from the eyes of the institution they, they was for saying you know like it's gonna help them with cheating but at that time I couldn't really touch on the the master plan of like you know 
like having a platform for the educators as well because we believe in like safe use of artificial intelligence and we believe in like you know the monitoring of this so then we come up with our our other platform which is like institutional friendly which is called SHP instead of the you know the kind of controversial name school hack but very Gen Z friendly name at the same time so we developed something for the institution that can help them monitor the students yeah mm -hmm. All right, so during COVID, we really thought EdTech would completely transform the education industry. Mm -hmm. And to a certain extent, it did. But we are now back to the regular classrooms. Has EdTech delivered on its promise on immersive education? Or is it just, again, programs being built in and allowing kids to learn from a screen? Yeah, definitely. So, um, COVID did change everything and uh, it did change the way we learn. So everyone shifted to more like e-learning and learning online. And uh, yeah, I'll say like, you know, the trend has continued post-COVID for sure. And I'll say like EdTech yes, has, has done a quite a good job, the industry as a whole. So I'm really intrigued about the use of the metaverse for training and education, you know. Mm -hmm. So what opportunities to, to both of you experts um, mm -hmm. do you think that will bring to the EdTech sp um, space? Um, the metaverse, yeah, the metaverse is an interesting subject, right? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I'm, I'm, I feel like we're still a very long way away from the metaverse, personally, mm -hmm. in, in in my personal opinion. So I feel like right now, not just because of a uh, you know like school hack, because I've also been involved in the metaverse pretty heavy as well. But um, just judging by current technology, I feel like yeah, we're like maybe like 20 years away from that. So I, I don't think it can do much as of now but right. in the future absolutely yeah we're just not really yet in my opinion so i hear that dubai police has been experimenting with it for training purposes yeah. and it it just blew my mind to think about the opportunities of kids that maybe don't have access to physical education and how these you know ai and metaverse and yeah. these kind of tools could actually help so many kids actually get access to education and if we can empower teachers to use it so, to be very honest, I think Metaverse uh, got its hype before the technology was mature. Absolutely. So people started talking about Metaverse even before the technology was out there for mass adoption. I would put it as immersive experiences more than Metaverse per se, because the minute you say Metaverse, we get into the second life, you know, putting on a VR goggle and living, you know, living our experiences out in a virtual world. I think what we need to look at is immersive virtual experiences yeah. which give you the same kind of learning experiences so for example like Dubai police or even technical companies are allowing employees to really look at assets virtually so it doesn't again mean a holographic you know image of the asset it's just dashboards so this a concept called digital twin mm -hmm. which is really gaining a lot of traction so imagine you have a very expensive piece of equipment like a wind turbine or, or a jet engine, how do you monitor it real time without physically inspecting it? Because physically inspecting an engine or a bridge or a building is next to impossible or it's very expensive. So what do you do is create a virtual twin where you have sensors in different places, critical areas of that asset, and it gives you a real time view of what the physical asset is. Mm -hmm. How is it performing? Uh, where are the potential, you know, uh, Prevent, uh, preventive maintenance required. Yeah. So those are the areas that we need to look at. There's so much to get our heads around <laughs> on this one. Uh, gents, can't thank you enough for both joining us. Do stick yeah. around, though, because we need more from you. School hack available now here, is it? Uh, yes, available now here. Yeah. Good stuff. All the best with thank it you. as well. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank Do you very much. What's up next? We actually are testing Ravi. Oh, really? Yes, we are putting you to the test. This is our DXB in 60. Okay. So it's a quiz on about everything that's happened on the show. So I'm going to ask you some questions mm -hmm. and you're going to select the right answer. Is that a cheat sheet? No. <laughs> <laughs> there's no AI for this one. There's no, there's no chat GPT for this one. Okay, so I'm going to cue the clock in three, two, one. What day did we celebrate on the show today? International Day of Light or International Day of Bright? International Day of Light. First one is correct. Um, the popular AI tool is short for artificial intelligence or artificial ingredients? Artificial <laughs> ingredients. <laughs> <laughs> that is incorrect. Um, what do the Z pools we featured on the show today help you do? Helps you learn about AI or helps you unplug and promote good sleep? I think both. Uh, 
Incorrect. <laughs> but we'll give you a pass on that one. Oh, all right. What is the purpose of the International Day of Light? To celebrate the invention of the first light bulb or to raise awareness about the importance of light-based technologies? I think the importance of light-based technology. Correct. What is ChatGPT, a natural language processing tool dri driven by AI technology or a social media platform? <laughs> <laughs> a social media platform. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next one. Today's guest, Fahad Bizari, is the founder of the International Institute for AI Literacy and Adoption or Special Intelligence Center. The AI Institute. Correct. Yeah. Okay, time is up. You got six points. Six Thank good. you so much. Well six done. Well done. Yes. Well, done. <laughs> Very well done. Well done. You can walk away with your head held high. Top there you are. You actually <laughs> the top of the leaderboard. This Seriously. Week. Yeah. Well oh, done. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much, so much shock in Ravi's voice. Uh, Ravi, thank you so much for joining so us. Much. Hope to see you on the show again very soon. Thank you so much. We had great fun. Thank you so much for thank inviting you. me. Thank you. Now, uh, please do not go anywhere, okay? Because after the break, we have some beautiful tunes right here in the studio. <laughs> Now, welcome back to the show. Now, I am joined by Sudanese singer-songwriter based right here in Dubai, Jindi. Welcome to the show. Hey, thank you guys for having me. Thank you for being here. I guess I hear it's your second time being here. Yeah, yeah, So, yeah, we yeah. love you that much. So, tell me about your music. So, I'm a singer-songwriter and I've been uh, kind of doing like uh, a world kind of music uh, genre. So, it involves like a lot of uh, reggae, R&B, pop. And now, uh, I'm kind of focused on a genre called Afro-Sudanese where I bring in like Sudanese dialect with like Afrobeat. And yeah, it's been good. It's been uh, fire, fire, fire. <laughs> Amazing. And I hear you just got back from Kenya working yeah. with international artists. Yeah, yeah. So I did the remix of my uh, latest song, Hassa. And it happens to be like my biggest song up to date. So the acceptance has been good in Dubai and outside. So Amazing. yeah, I'm hoping to uh, drop some more music in the upcoming months. And hopefully the world uh, gets to listen soon, you know. Okay, so where can people find you? Jindy official across all platforms. Fire. Mr. Fire. Okay, I can't wait to hear what you've got for us. So I'm going to let you set up and we're going to go back to Tom and see what he's got. Well, thank you very much indeed. Yeah, looking forward to that one now. Dinner? Yeah, sure. Sure. Okay. Uh, giving away a dinner for two at <laughs> Team and Duck in Caesar's Palace. We're not giving it away, we're having it, aren't we? Yeah, you know, of no. We are. no, we'd like to give it to you. Uh, and all you have to do to win it is head down to the Dubai One Instagram page round about now. You'll find the competition post, Team and Duck, uh, and tell us why we should pick. You. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And we also want to hear from you. So don't forget to use the hashtag DXV today and shout out or share what you'd like to see more of. Or even if you'd like to come on the show yourself, just let us know. Well, thank you both for um, shining some light today on the show. Oh, nice. You Nicely done there. Yeah. yeah. No, you really Wonderful. did. You know, you opened up all uh, new ways of thinking, mm -hmm. shining some light on some topics I hadn't thought about before. So thank you. Very smooth, Mr. Urquhart. Mm. Very smooth. You know, it was just great having a chat GPT with you both. Very good. Yeah. See? <laughs> there you go. That's fantastic. Really like that. <laughs> really good. Yeah, this is when we're going to get replaced. <laughs> by a GPT they, and AI. They, they cannot replace good satire like that. <laughs> Okay, guys, that is all for us today. See you right here tomorrow night where we explore the latest in telecommunications and how our phones have changed our lives. Ma'as-salama.